I guess when I look at an ancient site, I'm, I'm doing a number of things at once. I'm, I'm thinking about the past, I'm thinking about the present, and I'm thinking about the, the future. These sites and objects have to, you know, as soon as they're excavated, they, they, they become part of the present. They have to exist in the present. So how do we, um, how do we protect them and how do we use them culturally and for e education and, uh, and consider their well-being as material objects? So, Tanya, the first time you go to, I, was it the first time you, in 1974, was it the first time you went to China that you, that you saw the Terracotta Warriors, or was that when you just became aware of them? That was when I became aware of them. I was just a youngster, but I was fascinated already, and the first time I went was in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. they were discovered in 1974 during the Cultural Revolution, so it wasn't really an easy time to go, and I was probably a bit too young to make it over at that time, but... Um, things had changed in the 1980s. China had started to open up. Um, in 1987, the Warriors became a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. And I was able to visit uh, right at that time. So that was the first time and it was just the Warriors. And um, and now I think we know much more about the site and, and much more about what's there. The Warriors are one amazing part of something that's, you know, an even more amazing complex so so what is it Tanya, just so the audience understands like what is the whole site and what you know just tell us about what it is yeah the site um is is colossal it's uh around um 56 square kilometers i think that's about 22 square miles so it's equivalent to in size to a you know to a really um huge metropolis um, the Warriors are really one part of it that's um, two to three kilometres from the from the main core of the tomb itself. Um, so while we th th we think they're really important, which they are, they're actually um, not the most important part of the tomb itself. So since the discovery in 1974 of the Warriors, uh, work has continued at the site and surveys have been done and there are more than 200 pits that have been discovered there. Um, so there's a, a huge pyramid, bigger than the pyramids in Egypt. Um, inside that or beneath that is um, the, the tomb itself of the first emperor of China. And then surrounding it, there are um, there are other, other pits, other structures. There was architecture. There was a really a whole palace. There was um, an administration. There were ritual buildings. So it's an absolutely colossal um, site. And, and really the warriors are just the, the exciting tip of the iceberg. Why, why were you so excited even as a young woman to want to go there? What was, you know, and where are you from? So that everyone, and this is Tanya. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, little intro. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I'm a professor, um, a principal fellow at the University of Melbourne. I'm also a distinguished research fellow um, at uh, uh, Northwestern Polytechnical University um, in Xi'an, China. Um, and I've always been fascinated by, by mysteries, I guess, and, uh, and to really understand the, the history, and I love art, the art of China, uh, it was a, a big challenge. I, I like challenges um, and uh, the, the um, amount of cultural materials in China, it's really infinite. There's just so much to be discovered. So I'm an art historian. I work closely with archaeologists and also material conservators. So uh, I take a multidisciplinary approach and really the cultural materials in China are, are infinite. Um, I work in the heartland of China where uh, two thirds of the cultural materials are there. Um, and uh, there's new, new exciting things being discovered all the time. So for me, it's an opportunity to really participate in something that's, uh, that's important, that's fresh, and to really construct um, our understanding of the history of um, Chinese civilization and of material culture in the world. So what was this thing? Like, was it, did the, did the, when the first emperor died, did he bury it so that nobody would know what it was? And then we found it in the 1980s. Like what, what 
is the thing or was it just there and then it ended up being buried by the sands of time like how did it get under the sand <laughs> Well, it was buried, um, I, I think at the time, so more than 2000, so we're talking about the third century BC, BCE. Um, it, it wasn't, uh, it, you couldn't miss it. It was a huge complex. There were 700,000 workers who contributed to creating the, the site and all its artifacts. And the work went on there to build it for 38 years. So you certainly couldn't miss it at the time, um, but, but it did. Uh, it was lost to to memory. the the em The dynasty of the first emperor was very short. The Qin dynasty only lasted for fourteen years, mm -hmm. and it was overthrown. And uh, other dynasties uh, surpassed it. The dynasty that followed lasted for um, you know about four hundred years, and uh, it was the site was really forgotten. I think in local memory, people you know, been handed down, people thought that's what it was, but, um, I mean, but was, really, it a, was it a, did, could you see a, a hill? Could you see? Yeah, something? there's a huge, there's a huge mound there. Um, there's a huge mound there. It's, um, three, let me see. It's, it's, it's colossal. It's, I'll have to just check the, the measurements. It's, um, you can tidy this up later. Yeah, the tomb mound itself is is uh, forty seven meters high, and it's thirty three hundred and fifty meters uh, each side at the base. So as I said, it's bigger than the the um, you know the Great Pyramid at Giza, which is only one hundred and thirty nine meters square. So so there's it's a huge thing. It's and it's a it's a man made uh, or human made mountain. So. The, the evidence was there, but so much is below ground in the in the pits, and uh, those those were hidden. When you when you went there the first time, and you you sort of got down in there with the warriors, what because they're each different, right? There's how many of them, and they're and they're each different. Like, what do you think the thought process on that was? How they made them? Well, there's about eight thousand of them, so it's a colossal number there. Uh, vast in scale, they're about 1.9 meters high, so they're, you know, the, the basketball players of, you know, the military, I guess. Um, they're all young, young, fit, healthy, strong, uh, you know, soldiers. And with them, they're also their their generals, and the faces are all individual. Um, and I'm particularly impressed by the by the officers, the generals. You can look into their faces and really get a sense of uh, of who's strategic and who's ruthless. Maybe who was the who was the best you know the best best fighter or the or the best leader of his of his troops. So yeah, they're they're incredibly impressive. So it's the it's the concept and it's also the the scale of them and the the number how to produce so many um you know magnificent figures and and get them in situ so there's a whole manufacturing process uh behind them and uh and also the you have to think about the just the organization involved um, and also i mean when you're when you're able to go you know when we're able to look back and say the fact that you could even be so clear who are the generals who are the kind of the fighters who are the warriors that articulation and the detail how yeah. how impressive is that? And we think about everything is made in China. Like I guess this is where it all started, right? Like, I mean, it's really unbelievable. When to, to, to I wish we could show a picture or something. Maybe we could put a picture up for our for our get for mm, sure. watching because it would be great to kind of see what you're talking about. I mean, we've looked through them, but they're so detailed. Yeah, yeah, they're incredibly detailed, um, and they. I mean, we had this is the most probably the most powerful man in the world at the time, or is certainly in, in uh, Asia at that time. And he could command enormous resources. And it was a matter of um, pride that everything was, was made well. Since the warriors have been discovered, we've um, made many other discoveries there. Uh, there have been discoveries of objects of beauty and also objects of use like um, actual weapons. So the standard of uh, technology and also craftsmanship on all of the objects, whether they're uh, models, you know, like the, sol the soldiers are standing in for real soldiers or whether they're real weapons or 
sculptures of uh, life-size sculptures of bronze birds, cranes, swans, geese. Um, all of those are really uh, produced to a standard of very, you know, extreme excellence. So, um, you know, that was required, and it also was what the first emperor could command. You know, what what do you think he was? What what was his intention with all of this? What does he want the the viewer, is it intended for a viewer or is it, was it, this is how we go to the next world? Because, you know, like an Egyptian sort of philosophical point of view, like what was the idea here? Yeah, well, the first emperor's tomb, Qin Shi Huang's tomb comes out of a long tradition of tomb building in China. And um, this was, um, you know, enormous tombs were built by his ancestors going back many, many generations. Um, and also by his rivals. So it's a matter, I think that the tombs serve both the living and the dead. You know, they're a home for the soul and uh, they're kind of a mirror, um, a mirror world, a mirror of this world with, with all its best um, comforts and luxuries, but they also make political statements. If you're the, the an emperor who was a, a king and from a long line of kings and you, um, conquer all the other kingdoms in your geographic area and form a huge empire, then you're making, you need to make a big statement. And Qin Shi Huang didn't intend for his dynasty to collapse after 14 years. Um, but, um, you know, when there are political handovers, stuff oh, happens. Very, very <laughs> relevant. We won't get into our... Current we won't get into that. Wow, it's but, very relevant. <laughs> it is, you know. But what we can say that 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 you know those situations are as old as time. You yeah. know, if it, if it if the dynasty lasted fourteen years, but it took thirty nine years to build it all, how did he continue it all being built? Well, he started when he was thirteen years old. He became Qin King. Uh, king of the Qin kingdom when he was 13 years old. So as soon as he became king, he started work on his tomb. And uh, he became uh, emperor at 38 and died, uh, sorry, yeah, and died in his 40s. So, um, yeah. So he started much earlier. Um, you know, did, what was history like before this? Before well, before this um, giant tomb, do you know a lot about what the the kingdom was like before he became the emperor? In terms of Jeffrey? in terms of tombs, or in terms of well, the just situation? in terms of history, there you know were there other historical figures and things that you can find there? When is Genghis sure. Khan? He's much Genghis later. Khan, right? He's much later. Much yeah. much much later. Yeah, before before the first uh, emperor formed um, the empire of China. Um, you know, there were two long periods before that. There was, um, you know, the, there was this so-called spring and autumn period, and that lasted for a couple of hundred years. And there were about a hundred kingdoms in the, in the geographical area that's now China. And those were all, uh, some were, you know, cooperating and had alliances and so on, and some were competing and some were contesting. Um, the following period, the Warring States, was exactly um, as the title describes. And if you think about it, in the spring and autumn period, we had about 100 kingdoms. And in the Warring States period, which lasted for about 250 years, there are only seven kingdoms left. So this is a very kind of um, warrior culture period. And um, of the seven kingdoms in the Warring States period, so uh, Qin Shi Huang is born into the Warring States period um, and becomes a king at the age of 13 to lead the Qin Kingdom, which is one of the seven. Right. And then he, he spends, you know, decades fighting the other kingdoms until the Qin is the only one left. And it, it then conquers all of what is, you know, around about present day China. Wow. Yeah, all of those kingdoms had traditions of, of tomb building. So going right back into the spring and autumn period, it wasn't uh, replicas of people that went in the tombs. Actual, actual human sacrifices were made to serve the deceased in the afterlife, to serve the leaders. And uh, it was a, 
uh, as a uh, sympathetic, uh, compassionate change in the warring states period to stop that as a practice and to use models of people uh, and, you know, instead. So that's what happened at, at Chin Shi Huang's tomb with the terracotta warriors. So, so their purpose was to protect him in the afterlife? Their purpose was to protect him in the afterlife. Yeah, he had everything. There's everything that uh, could be was was in a normal above ground, you know, normal <laughs> above ground palace um, was was there at his mausoleum. And and what do you like beyond? Okay, there's sort of the what the fighting culture, but what other uh, takeaways do you learn from him? You know, what else do you know about why he? had that reign and then he was no longer successful like what what else because you've really there's so much detail and so much of it has been preserved you know what do we learn now that might, could be relevant for the way in which he was a leader you know again at 13 yeah saying yeah <laughs> well you know the martial aspect is really important uh technology is really important so the quality of for example um metalwork and weaponry was and also the chat you know the the design of the the chariots um all of those things made you know plus the mentality and the and the strategy made the chin superior war you know warriors um but it wasn't just about um martial culture the what we find out at the tomb is that it's also really sophisticated and a very high sense of you know aesthetics and culture and a, a sense of um you know enjoyment with music and entertainment and uh you know acrobatic performances and even sumo wrestling so a whole spectrum of um you know of activities and um a sense of um you know artistic taste and does it feel that the they're, they're, that they've been passed forward? I mean, does it feel modern to you when you, I mean, does it feel con, sort of contemporary? Or what is the relationship? You know, what has survived all these many thousand years? <laughs> well, a, a, an enormous amount has, uh, has survived there. Um, and I guess when I look at an ancient site, I'm, I'm doing a number of things at once. I'm, I'm thinking about the past, I'm thinking about the present, and I'm thinking about the, the future. So when these, um, you know, when these sites and these objects were, you know, were created, um, you know, we really have to think about, you know, what is it and, and why was it created? Um, but when we think about the present, we have to, you know, these sites and objects have to, you know, as soon as they're excavated, they, they, they become part of the present. They have to exist in the present. So how do we, um, how do we protect them and how do we, you know, look after them and how do we understand them, you know, and they also take on new meanings in the present day um, compared to what their original meaning was. And then because I'm also we thinking about the cultures. We don't understand what they were forged in. Well, by once we look at the objects, we we do under, we start to understand more, you know, the Qin dynasty was very little known until the until the First Emperor's tomb was discovered, right. and um, so so really the Qin um, became a, you know became became to life through through the tomb. Um, yeah, but it has different. It also has meanings. You know, if in contemporary society, it it, it ha, it's sort of about um, China's national sense of national pride culturally and for heritage, but also uh, you know sort of it's a, a strong a strong united kind of image presented by the warriors and it also you know even on an economic level there's a role to play in today's society with um you know tourism and uh or through cultural diplomacy Did and then another issue is how we look after them in the future so past present future they we have to uh, you know preserve them and and uh, continue their life into the future it can't be the same life that objects had when they were you know, buried under the earth and no one knew they were there. We have to uh, use them culturally and for e education and uh, and consider their well-being as material objects. Looking at that, do, do you see kind of 
China now in being such a strong power and so organized? You know, I want to go back to that for a minute. Do you, do you, do, when you go back and sort of ever, do you ever compare other cultures? You talked about Egypt before, like, do we see this kind of infrastructure and organization in other cultures? Or do you feel like this, you know, this sort of what, what, we, what we see here from China is, is surpasses, you know, there was sort of a sophistication and organization. I'm trying to, you know, their play, place in the world continues, right? So is there anything parallel in those times that has the same standards and the same precision, maybe? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I think certainly the, the Qin was, a, was an important time in China because it, it did unify China and it had means to do that. It was, it was not just about the military and, and organization. It was also about unifying uh, language, written language about weights and measures, about um, even axle widths. So if you think about infrastructure and transportation, um, you know, so there were a number of things that were um, made consistent that helped to hold the country together. Um, you know, China has a long and continuous culture and it is a, a unified country and has been, but, you know, it also has expanded and, and, and shrunk and it has at times fallen apart and come together, um, you know, just, just as Europe has. Um, you know, so there's certainly other other countries with very, um, you know, sophisticated cultures and and philosophies, um, you know, it, it, at that time. So we're talking about the the time of you know classical um, Greece and Rome uh, in in Europe, and you know, so it, uh, there was highest levels of civilization, uh, and and China, you know, has had its high points um, amongst them. Um, you know, uh, the, um, the warriors, like, what does it do for the, have you ever done a genetic test to see if the people around the area where are the same? I think that tests have been, have been done. Yes. And I think that there are people who've lived in that location for, you know, for all, all you know, their families, all that, all that time. Uh, but people were brought from all over to work on the tomb um, and at the site, there are, of course, the first emperors buried there, and um, and other members of the imperial family and uh, a court are also buried there. And and then there are, um, you know, there were so many workers, and some of them they were some of them were convicts, some of them were um, maybe leaders or of rival states, and some of those people were worked very harshly at the tomb and, and were buried there, they were worked to death. So we know the identities of some of those people because uh, little clay plaques were uh, interred in the uh, mass pits uh, or in individual graves with, with some of those people. So um, yeah, not all were local. So people came from you know all over to, no, to work no, there. Why would they put animals and stuff in? Yeah, so there are actually real animals buried um, at the tomb, mm -hmm. and um, I guess it was okay. It was okay to uh, sacrifice animals, you know. So uh, animals were there for you know for food, and they were also there in stables, in underground stables. Um, and do you feel like the pictures that they showed you in the ground there, all, some of the other things, were an accurate reflection of what it was like in life? Uh, I think it's an accurate, accurate uh, representation of, uh, of Qin Shi Huang's life and, uh, you know, the beauty that surrounded him and, you know, the, the huge forces at his command and, you know, his, his entourage of, of officials and, you know, and staff and, and entertainers and so on surrounding him, the whole coterie. But that was not the life for ordinary people. And excavations at, of ordinary of sites where ordinary people live just, you know, that shows, um, you know, simple farming life. You know, if you were a more successful farmer or you had more land and, and you, you had workers, you could have a bigger, you know, a bigger mansion, but it was a, you know, the, these were sort of sites of cottage industry and so on. But imperial sites are sites of, you know, extreme 
beauty and sophistication. It really shows us the best of the best. And what about the kind of the spiritual, the religious, you know, the sacred aspect too? Like what, what can we learn from there? And is that, is there a continuum? I mean, if we think about Buddhism or what, you know, whatever the practice is, is that, do you see evidence of that? And how does that sort of play into the story? Yeah, well, at this time, um, you know, it's a pre, this is pre-Buddhism in China. So we're thinking about a Taoist philosophy of, um, of the afterlife and the soul living on. Um, later, when Buddhism uh, arrives in China, then, you know, the imagery at some, at tombs changes, the burial practices change. There's, um, uh, and there are, there are all sorts of religions as time moves moves forward in in China uh, you know there are in the, for example in the Tang dynasty which is in the seventh eighth um, ninth century there are there are Christians living in the Chinese capital there are Zoroastrians you know so it's it's China became quite um, multicultural and uh, you know there was space for um, and permission for uh, other religions. And there was, you know, periods of religious, I suppose, crackdown and, and, and uh, restriction. And then there were periods of religious freedom and, uh, you know, open, openness. Do these, um, how did this, these terracotta warriors affect the next kings? Did they see that and say, well, I need to have that? Or did, did they not even see it in their lifetime? Yeah, they did. Uh, interestingly enough, when the Qin Dynasty fell, um, there were peasant, peasant, you know, farmer or peasant uprising. The people rose up, and the military also uh, rebelled. So the tomb, everyone knew the tomb was there. I mean, so there'd been workers knew the layout of the tomb and so on. So the tomb was broken into, and out of a sense of fury at the really the harsh times that people had suffered under. Uh, Qin Shi Huang, and you have to remember, it was not only building his mausoleum, he was, the, he was building the Great Wall, and there were all sorts of other enormous infrastructure mm -hmm. projects. So people really had, you know, were required to do a lot of forced labor, and it was, it was tough. Yeah. Um, yeah, people broke into the tomb and um, set fire to it. So above the, the, the pits where the warriors are, there were huge, uh, you know, timber beams, and the tomb was set alight. Um, the, the timbers uh, burnt and the ho all of the earth above collapsed. And that's what caused the warriors to, you know, to break into, you know, many, many um, shards. That was, that was their response. Despite, right. despite that and despite the huge resources that, you know, it cost the national treasury and the human suffering, in the subsequent dynasty, the Han dynasty that was established, uh, which was not a sense of divine rulers, but a sense of ordinary uh, people who who rose to become uh, emperors and formed their a new a new dynastic su succession. They also built colossal tombs, uh, you know, just about as big as the first emperor's tomb. Um, they were very conscious of of that, you know, the human and economic costs. So there were um, you know, changes made and the, the scale of the figures, instead of being, you know, nearly two metres high, they were, you know, about 60 centimetres high, you know, about two, two feet high um, and much more simple. But on the other hand, instead of being 8,000, there might have been 20,000 or 30,000 figures. So they also had their um, egos to to satisfy and to uh, you know put on a, a decent uh, a decent show of their uh, of their authority and and command and, and that continued right through right through the dynasties it was a you know tradition emperors had huge tombs and um, uh, full of full of amazing you know things. When were you last back in China? Well, 2020 wasn't the year to go, but uh, I was there in <laughs> in November 2019. So I'm, you know, looking forward to going back. I, I'm in China every year, and uh, you know, usually go a couple of times, you know, for, for you a month, just, or up to six months. 
have you discovered something new when you were there? Uh, I'm, I'm not an archaeologist, so that's not my position to come from Australia and, mm. and uh, <laughs> yeah. go find things. But, uh, but I'm very fortunate to go with my, my wonderful um, archaeologist colleagues. And they sh always show me the, the latest things that they've discovered. One of the most amazing things um, is a stone city. It's more than 4,000 years old in the north of China called Shamao, Stone City. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an unimaginably um, captivating place. It's up in a remote area. Um, and um, so it's a very recent discovery. It's been made a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's, uh, on, it's one of the top 10 discoveries of the 21st century. Um, it's a site uh, of, a, of a capital city, uh, with, which is um, you know, about a few, few kilometers, you know, maybe three kilometers three kilometres by, by two, two or more kilometres. Uh, it's a walled city with really sophisticated gates. It um, has a residential sector, um, an inner sector, and then it has a citadel on a high position, which would have been uh, where the, the leader, or maybe the king, resided. Uh, and they found the most beautiful, in amongst this beautiful stonework of multi-storey buildings, um, they've found the most exquisite jades and um, magnificent sculptures of, of eagles and huge carved stonework of, of men and animals and gods. Um, and curiously, um, pits of, you know, they've found burials there, but also curious pits of skulls, mm. um, which belong to mainly young women. Just the so, skulls? Just the skulls. So there was some interesting sacri sacrificial practices there. So, only, I'm sorry, you just said it was mostly women? Only mostly women. women. Mostly young women. Wow. And what do, you, what do we think that was yeah, about? What are we thinking about that? Well, uh, we're still figuring it out. So there were, I mean, there's some really interesting practices there so human sacrifice is one and right. some of these are uh, on, near the walls and under the the, the um, entrance way under the earth at the main entrance way to the city mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there must have been some public we you know presumably public rituals and maybe they had you know this was thought to have some kind of protective or and intimidating um effect so uh within the walls also there were you know really huge pieces of the most magnificent jade formed into uh ritual um you know knives and axes and that kind of thing jade jade objects so they, were, they weren't ones that you could use in real life but they they were just very very beautiful ritual objects inserted into the walls so these probably had some kind of you know protective quality yeah. In some of these artifacts, I mean, where where's the female presence? Because all is it is it was it mostly male that gets preserved or gets to have all of these after <laughs> fancy stuff happening, or or are there female presence? Yeah, you know, there 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 you know female. There's a female presence as well. Uh, Qin Shi Huang's the first emperor's grandmother had a had a big tomb, uh, and at her big tomb there was a chariot with six horses you know so the the actual an actual chariot with actually six horses the, the skeletons are there still yoked to the to the chariot well only kings could have six horses mm. on their chariots so even in those early times and if even going back there were um fu hao was another one um of an earlier period not in chin shi huang's family but a rival state right. and she was a, a a warrior queen so there were uh, very important women. In the dynasty, the, the Han that followed the Qin, um, the emperor's uh, wives, the empresses, had uh, pyramids and tombs as big, almost as big, a few, few metres smaller, but almost as big as um, their husbands. Because the, they were 
not only important as emperors, empress, empresses, but they were also the mother of the next emperor. So they got colossal tombs. By the Tang Dynasty, the, there's of course the infamous uh, Empress Wu Zetian, Empress Wu, and she she was an emperor in her own right. Well, and they tried to sort of write her out of history, yeah. Yeah, they did. They did, um, uh, but she's, she, uh, it, it hasn't happened and, and uh, she got a bad rap during the millennia, you know, the- Although she the, was sort of one, sort of one in a way because isn't that one, uh, that one site still a magnificent sort of it, shrine to her? What do you there call that is, site? Uh, Chanling, yeah, she's, Empress Wu is buried um, in a colossal tomb, which is, uh, it's actually a mountain. So it uh, surpasses all the pyramid tombs because of its scale. And there are a number of these mountain tombs that emperors had in the Tang Dynasty. So she's buried inside, that, inside this mountain with, a, with the, all of the attributes of a, of a colossal emperor's mausoleum. Um, and um, yeah, so yeah, I think it's, so we can reevaluate her we were able to reevaluate her contribution uh, with fresh eyes in the in the modern in the modern era. So why do you keep looking? And you know, what's it like when you get to a site that you haven't been to before? Like, what are you thinking about? Uh, well, it's it's about you know it's about going from mystery to to history. It's about Really, uh, I don't want to say filling in the blanks exactly, but it's but but it's really every new piece of every new discovery is a new piece of evidence, and every every new piece of evidence changes the stories in in some way. Mm -hmm. And and I'm a particular kind of art historian because whilst I love you know museums and 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 the, all the great functions of uh, enjoyment and education and preservation that, that, that they have in their role. Um, I, my, the way I work is I want to see the art in situ. I want to see it in its, in the pit or in the, in the underground architecture, uh, you know, where, so, so it's like going, going um, through a portal to the past. You know, if when something's freshly dug, it, it, no one has looked at that, no one's touched it, uh, no one's considered it uh, for, for, you know, for centuries or even thousands of years. So it's really, it's a window into, directly into the past. Um, you know, things are there and they, they're there, you know, hopefully as they were, as they were left. So I like to see them in situ, I, I like to see them in relation to the other objects and how they were um, placed uh, or used. And also an important part for me is the, is the location. So you can learn a lot from the actual location. So uh, I've been very privileged to see objects excavated and then follow their, their path to the, you know, to the lab for, for cleaning and conservation and then to study them, to understand them better. Didn't and then eventually I've seen them in museums. Didn't you find a headdress like that? The, um, there's, there've been a number of uh, amazing uh, headdresses found. I, again, I'm not an archeologist, so I, I didn't find it, but I've, I've, I watched it, which was a Tang Dynasty crown, so-called Phoenix crown of a minor royal um, in the Tang Dynasty imperial family, but a magnificent crown. And, uh, it, you know, it takes many years for, um, you know, for the, for the whole process to be, to be done uh, from discovery through to uh, a kind of, through the process of conservation and stabilization to the point where uh, it can be seen by people. You know, Tonya, so you said earlier this thing that, you know, you, you, the mystery to the history, but you yeah. also said it's for the future too. So as yep. we sort of are, my final question to you for today is, what does all of this do in your thinking around the future? What is the learning? Where do we, 
you know, I mean, if the love of it is one thing and the, and the you know, really taking care of this, which is such an important thing as we see a lot of times artifacts get destroyed or people don't really understand the importance of understanding culture and protecting. Yeah. But you yeah. know, for you also the, where does it make you think about the future? And specifically, you know, you don't, you're not, you're not from China yet you have this unbelievable passion and love and dedication. Yeah. Just, just your thought around that. Um, well, we need to, we need to understand uh, what's being discovered and what needs to be managed and it needs to be protected. Um, in some cases it needs to be rescued, but we also need to use it. We, it needs to find its place. Uh, as I said, the, these objects from the past and these sites from the past, they exist in the contemporary world. So how do we accommodate them? So it's important that, um, you know, really at the, at, the, at the community and especially at the government level, that um, you know that 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 these activities are supported, which I feel in China they they are. There's a real appreciation and understanding of the significance on all the sorts of levels we've talked about uh, today. And uh, for me, it's a really interesting challenge as a, a foreigner to to have uh, come to understand you know, the history and cultural heritage of, of China and to work with the really, you know, wonderful experts there who've become my, my great friends. Um, yeah, and I, it's important, you know, so it has been a challenge for me to, to understand over the years and uh, to, how, you know, and then how can I give back? So I, in some ways I see myself as a, I can be a, a bridge, um, and to help with communication. The experts in China are really busy with the work, the wonderful work they're doing. Uh, and so it's something that I can do is to communicate to people internationally about the great work that's being done and, and the wonderful discoveries and, and why, what, what their significance is. Yeah, so it's something I am happy to contribute to. You know, Tanya, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. It was incredibly interesting. I really, I really appreciate it. And I hope to talk to you again. You know, Priscilla, do you want to say something? Yeah, just again, being such a, you, like you said, being the sort of guardian and steward, really. I think that, 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 you know, it is the more that people like you really help us understand and, and take serious, you know, take it. It, not everybody really has that passion, and and so and and I think it's it's a wonderful and important work that you do do, and I'm sure yeah. your friends in China are really <laughs> grateful. And yeah, you hopefully. found your tribe; they just were in China. Yeah. yeah. Oh well, there's a, there's a lot of tribes. I've spent a bit of time in the U.S. as well, so uh, mm -hmm. I've got tribes all over, but uh, and and good friends all over. So, so, so here you're looking at stuff that's at least two hundred years old. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't have much history here. You know. uh, it's a great country, though. It's a great country. Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree. Thank you well, I agree. for coming yeah. and visiting us. Yeah, thank you very My much. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really thrilled. Thank yeah. you.